I would like to welcome you to our third annual Meet the Chiefs Gala dinner. As you know, tonight's dinner is a celebration of our public sector planning leadership. Really a thank you to a special group of public servants who are shaping our fast growing metropolis, the fourth largest city in North America uh, and the fastest growing. Each year we have changed up the programming a bit and tonight is no different. This year we're part of the two day ULI Symposium, which is happening yesterday and today, um, which has been an incredible event so far and attracted over 100 international and local speakers. There are many interesting narratives that have come emerged through the symposium, but one of the overarching ones that has become increasingly apparent is the how we build and govern our world cities is taking on significantly more importance than it ever has before. Tonight, we have invited Professor Martin Heyer, Professor of Urban Futures, Utrecht University of the Netherlands, to deliver remarks after dinner. He will speak on why bold urban thinking is required to tackle two of these global challenges, social equity and climate change. We have asked uh, Toronto's chief planner, Jennifer Kiesmat, to conduct a brief interview with Professor Heyer after, after the remarks to, con to, con to contextualize his global urban message to the greater Golden Horseshoe. I would now like to take a moment to thank our sponsors. You'll forgive me for not reading the names of all 34 of our table sponsors, um, but uh, obviously we really appreciate your support and my, uh, you have my sincere appreciation and gratitude. As a result of your enthusiastic support, this year's gala dinner sold out over a month ago and we actually didn't have any individual tickets available for sale. This is obviously a good problem to have and, and thank you very much. Your support allows us to advance our work as an industry association committed to the responsible use of land and creating thriving and healthy communities. I next want to thank Uber, who are joining us for the first time this year as reception sponsor. It's a great sign of the evolution of an organization like ULI, who's focused on land use, to be able to partner with an organization like Uber, who's focused on technology and mobility. But it's also indicative of and highlights the ongoing need to break down the silos of city building. We will hear from Sheldon McCormick, General Manager, Uber Canada, a little bit later this evening. Thank you, Uber. <laughs> and a big thank you to WSP, who have returned for the third year for Meet the Chiefs as our panel sponsor. As global city builders, WSP shares a lot of DNA with the Urban Land Institute, which itself operates in over 20 countries around the world. WSP is very much part of the Glo uh, Golden Horseshoe expansion story and is obviously intricately involved in many of our local communities. I'm looking forward to hearing from Chris Tyrell, National Vice President, Planning, Landscape Architecture and Urban Design, who will introduce tonight's keynote speaker. Thank you, WSP. <laughs> Those of you who attended this morning's symposium opening remarks will have already heard me comment on just how impressive it is that our international airport has taken on such a significant and widespread region building role. So I, I want to really state my appreciation to Toronto Pearson, who are back this year as, for the third year as the presenting sponsor of Meet the Chiefs, uh, the Meet the Chiefs Gala. Truly the, thank you. The involvement of Toronto Pearson uh, with, with both weighty regional issues as well as the most granular street level community involvement is really commendable. A specific example is the excitement that is emerging around how Pearson is partnering with its lo local municipalities and commercial neighbours which constitute the second largest employment zone in Canada to create a new transit hub which has been dubbed Union Station West. Make no mistake, Pierce, Toronto Pearson is a serious region builder. So it is with my, my pleasure to invite Hilary Marshall, Vice President, Stakeholder Relations and Communications, T T Toronto Pearson, to our podium, representing our 2017 Meet the Chiefs presenting sponsor. Hilary. Thanks, Derek. Thanks, Derek. Derek, Richard, congratulations on a sold out evening. You sold out a month ago. You know, as I was walking in tonight, somebody was standing out front scalping tickets to this. Or was that the Raptors game? I can't remember. 
Anyway, it's good to be back again to help host Meet the Chiefs. The impetus for this dinner and today's symposium is to bring together delegates who are going to discuss how to make the Toronto region a better place to live, work, learn, play, and invest. I don't need to tell you that there are certainly challenges to overcome and problems to be solved, but we're in a very enviable position. We're here to plot a way forward for the future of Canada's largest and fastest growing city region. And at Toronto Pearson, we're well aware that our growth is linked to that of the region. It's a virtuous cycle that sees us contribute through connectivity and employment opportunities, even as our passenger numbers continue to grow on the back of impressive growth of the surrounding communities. We're planning for the future too, not just from, capacity, from a capacity management point of view, but by ensuring that we, along with the communities we serve, grow sustainably well into the future. Toronto Pearson is primed to join an elite group of airports worldwide known as mega hubs, airports that bring the world to their passengers' doors, and in doing so, open up a host of possibilities for regional growth. We've prepared a short video that explains a bit more about the exciting things that are happening at Toronto Pearson and what this means for the region. Don't worry, it's not this morning's video. It's a new video. Roll it. Ain't she a beauty? This airport of ours is unquestionably one of the world's finest. A truly global destination connecting North America to the world. The heart of our city and of our country, supporting trade, tourism, and opportunity not just in Toronto, but all across Canada. But Pearson is on a journey of its own to becoming the world's best airport, bigger, better, and more connected than ever before. Together, we're going to transform our airport from global hub to mega hub. In becoming a mega hub, we'll be joining the ranks of just 11 of the world's most elite airports in London, New York, Paris, and Hong Kong, to name a few. We've already done much of the work to get there, in fact, just look how far we've come. We've got all the ingredients, we have the plan, and we have our connection to new heights. The impact improving our airport will have on our passengers and our future reaches far past the end of the runway. Our airport already supports the second largest concentration of jobs in all of Canada. A mega hub will help create more jobs at Pearson and in our surrounding communities. It will invite more business and industry. It will help create stronger connections between Canada and the world, increasing trade and tourism. We'll be able to experience more and share more. Our neighborhoods and our country will thrive. Let's get the region and the country moving. Our journey to becoming the world's best airport, the next mega hub, is our connection to a great future. It's our motivation to do our best for our passengers every day. And it begins today. Our best destination yet awaits us. Are you ready? I'm ready. Uh, sorry, I get paid to say that. Toronto Pearson, much like the region itself, is on the cusp of great things, and it's for this reason we're so excited to be supporting ULI and its work. Thank you again for being part of the symposium today. I'd now like to invite a local hero and city builder, Executive Director of ULI Toronto, Richard Joy, to say a few words. So indeed, a very, very few words, because this is the time that we uh, now release you to your dinner conversations, and uh, that's for almost an hour, about 7.45, 7.50 or so, we'll be back with our very exciting uh, dinner program, so we're looking forward to that. Um, but uh, at, at every table, uh, 
pretty much. There should be a, a, a chief or honorary chief uh, who is uh, hopefully going to be a cornerstone of your conversation. There's also a ULI ambassador, uh, somebody who's a, a deep volunteer at, at ULI who's been given a few questions to maybe stoke some table conversations. So we hope you will uh, uh, plod through a few of them. At some point, of course, that, that might dissolve into more uh, intimate conversations, but just want to make sure that we have a robust conversation about some of the great city building issues. And we'll see you in about an hour. Thank you. All right, our uh, dinner program. My name again is Richard Joy, even though I sound a bit like Brian Mulroney right now with a bit of a chest cold. Um, and I'm uh, pleased to set up tonight's special dinner program. As our chair, Derek Goring, mentioned earlier, we have changed up our Meet the Chiefs program this year as we have each year somewhat. And this year we are very excited to leverage the strength of our two-day symposium that we are in the middle of to present a very interesting international thought leader, Professor Martin Heyer. I will be calling up Chris Tyrell, National Vice President, Planning, Landscape, Architecture, and Urban Design of WSP to make the formal introductions, but briefly allow me a minute to speak about some of the highlights of ULI Toronto's work over the past year in pursuit of our global mission to advance the responsible use of land. At last year's dinner, those of you who were here, and that was many, we launched an initiative called Electric Cities, which committed us to broaden our audience beyond our traditional professional network. Some of the highlights of this pursuit over the last 12 months include expanded free programming aimed at community leadership, including tomorrow evening's lecture with New York City architect Elizabeth Diller of Highline fame, the introduction of Urban Plan, the Urban Land Institute's high school focused program, the launch of the Urban Leadership Initiative, a six month mid-career professional program led by former chief planner Paul Bedford, who's here tonight, established uh, to challenge both industry and community around the transformation of a critical mobility hub in the city, and the inclusion of over 150 non-professional members of, our, of the broader civil society leadership in our symposium um, this week at no charge to them. We think that's very important to have them in the audience for the first time. Electric Cities is a fluid idea that we continue to define, but it takes as essential the notion that as a professional organization, we are not fully able to be city region builders if we don't work more closely with community to build consensus around the challenge of urban transformation. And that we leverage the power of land use to build cities that deliver the broadest public good as we foster the economic viability of our industry. This commitment to the broader public good was at the foundation of the establishment of this dinner three years ago as we celebrate the public sector planning leadership of our fastest growing region in North America. And tonight's speaker is a perfect complement to this commitment. So with that, I'll keep it short, I'd like to now turn the podium to our major sponsor, WSP, and its representative tonight, Chris Tyrell, National Vice President, and we thank you, of course, for your generous support. Chris. Thank you so much, Richard, and good evening. Um, my name is Chris Tyrell, and I'm very pleased to represent WSP Canada tonight. WSP is very pleased to be back again as major sponsor for ULI's Toronto Meet the Chiefs Gala. And I couldn't say it any better than Derek said it uh, earlier tonight about how closely aligned the values and mission of WSP Canada and ULI are. Tonight, of course, is about celebrating our tremendous public sector planning leadership. That the Toronto region, the Greater Golden Horseshoe, has developed into one of the world's most livable and most attractive city regions is a testament to our civic leadership. But as mentioned earlier this evening, like all major global city regions, the future presents some daunting challenges that will require enormous and even more determined and creative thinking to overcome. Our speaker, Professor Martin Heyer, is a distinguished professor of urban futures at the Faculty of Ge Geosciences at Utrecht University 
and a director of the Urban Future Studio. Heyer studied political science as well as urban and regional planning at the University of Amsterdam and received a doctorate in philosophy in politics from Oxford. From 2008 to 2015, Heyer was the Director General of the Netherlands Environmental Assessment Agency. In 2016, Heyer was Chief Curator of the Next Economy, the 2016 edition of the International Architecture Biennale Rotterdam. Heyer is the author of the acclaimed The Politics of Environmental Discourse, as well as books such as in Search of the New Public Domain, and Smart About Cities, visualizing the challenge of 21st century urbanism. He is an acknowledged global thought leader in the study of positive urban futures. How can we harness the immense power of city building to achieve better urban and global outcomes in the century that lies ahead of us? As urbanist, Professor Heyer seeks to push our imagination to new frontiers. Specifically, and as previously mentioned, he will address two massive urban challenges of our time, social inequity and global climate change. We're delighted that Professor Heyer could join us this year, and I welcome him now to the podium. Thank you, for Thank you for your uh, very kind words and it's a delight to speak here in a city that uh, over the last couple of days I learned is very proud. Proud of its record and I think rightly so. So what can I do as an academic coming from Europe? What can I add? Um, let me give my uh, two cents worth and with the spirit that in order to keep that record Everything has to change in order for everything remaining the same. Now, those are first is a practical problem that where I stand, I can't see my screen. So we decided I'm going to do a shuffle so that at least I can click my slides quicker. So here I am to this part of the party saying, well, okay, what is our task? Let's realize that we are, and you can't open the newspaper, we are in a day and age that we know we face fundamental issues. This could be our best century or it could be our worst. And when I see the newspaper in Toronto, I see that the equity issue is really big. The affordability crisis haunts you all. I think it is on the table, but I think you can't solve it on its own. My argument is that we need more complexity more interconnections between issues in order to find solutions for the 21st century problems. So here are a few facts. Last Friday, we were told the level of CO2 in the atmosphere is 410 parts per million. It may not say much to you, I'm not a natural scientist either, but you should know that if we reach 200 and 450 parts per million, we have a 50% chance of reaching the two degree target. This is trouble. It means that the carbon budget is really, really limited, and you have to think about it in terms of social equity on a global scale, because we have built our cities already, but 40% of the cities of 2050, 40% still has to be built. That means that our carbon budget here in the, in, the, in, the, in the happy north is zero. Last year, 9,500 9, people in London died prematurely because of air pollution. It's negative. We haven't been able to tackle such a basic issue. In Boston, $85 billion worth of real estate is now in risk of flooding due to high tides, not to sea level rise. No, the first phenomenon of sea level rise, high tides. But then, and that's the problem and the difficulty of the, our day and age, how to read the, the tendency in our history. Last Friday as well, it was the first day in the UK that they had electricity without coal. So that is reassuring. 
the International Energy Agency told us that 30,000 solar panels will be installed every hour over the next five years. That's their estimate. And the International Energy Agency is always, when it comes to renewables, you know, having a dark view. Last Friday, wind power supplied 15% of Europe's electricity, and in Denmark, 98%. Yeah? So things are definitely changing. And perhaps as last indicator, Dong Energy won again last week two German tenders to build offshore wind farms, and they won because they uh, did not ask for subsidies. You know? So windmills that were supposed to run on subsidy are now running on market terms. So we are, ladies and gentlemen, in a period of transition. And these periods of transition are always coming with lots of uncertainty. And all the old models, the people who profess to know the certainties of the past, cannot tell you much about the future. And that is what made me so interested in urban futures. How do we deal with that radical uncertainty? So the challenge for me is basically to overcome an issue that is very recent. In the 1950s, we experienced something that is called the Great Acceleration. And all these graphs indicate things like the number of cars, the CO2 level rise, etc., and all spike in the 1950s. And that is for us as urban professionals a really crucial point. Because actually that was the period in which the cities that we now live in were built. So the cities we built were the cities that caused the problem. And I think we can only leave this room with a feeling that we're doing, showing our leadership, is we, if we realize that the way we built cities over the last century is not going to be providing us the solution for the 21st century. We need to think in terms of centuries. The 19th century was the age in which cities got their sanitation infrastructure, water, sewage systems, and the like. The 20th century is the century of the car. We expanded the city, we opened it up with the garden cities and the suburbs. And in the 21st city, well, basically, we have to think about solutions for 20th century failures. And it's fundamental. We need to think about new energy sources. We have to fundamentally rethink mobility, shelter, and food. All the basic categories, right? Shelter, food, fire. That is as fundamental as the challenge is. To give you a sense, so the Golden Horseshoe has some um, three and a half million dwellings. And if you want to actually get them climate neutral, which is sort of the most easy bit of the equation, you need to be starting getting them uh, climate neutral of 115,000 dwellings annually. Yeah. So that, that is, I presume, that if you look around yourself and you think, how many do we do now? We, okay, we insulate homes, but that's not making them climate neutral. So we have to undo the, the, the failures of the 20th century. And basically, that come, if you add all these things up, you have to realize that it is all about the social spatial organization of the region. It is not, you can't have a solution in the K side, you can't have a solution in downtown Toronto, you can't have a solution in the suburb. It's a regional strategy that you need. So you need to overcome all the hurdles of governance structures that are not living up to the expectations, you have to find a new way of planning. So how can we do that? And my academic take is that we may use a trick. We may use a trick of trying to organize the future into our present. And that is something that many of my colleagues now are interested in. And I, I, let me give you a sense of how that worked in the past. This phase, I'm sure, you uh, recognize it's, of course, the Swiss-French architect Le Corbusier. And he is probably the man that was most influential in developing the imaginary that built the 20th century city. His famous dictum was, uh, uh, let's kill the street, and also a home is a machine for living. He was the man, the man that uh, designed Plan Fazen and La Ville Radieuse. And if you see that morphology, it is the skyscraper in the park. I think, how far did we get? We made a city in the park. And that's about as far as we got away from the 1925 ideal. But it wasn't only the genius of Le Corbusier. 
that created that powerful imaginary that sticks with our imagination. It was actually also the product of what we call techniques of futuring, ways to imprint an imaginary on the people's minds that dominates their ideals. And that technique of futuring that was most powerful was the World Exposition of 1939 in New York. In this particular pavilion, you recognize the two letters GM, was built not by Le Corbusier, not by an architect, but by General Motors. And in this pavilion, through which some 20 million Americans flocked to see the future, the world of 1960, evolving, revolving around the, the maquette of the world of 1960, in that pavilion, of course, you saw the world that was now possible because cars had come and people could live in the suburbs and we could organize, reorganize our cities. And when the people left the pavilion, they got a pin. And the pin said, I have seen the future. So this was a technique of actually allowing people to, to, you know, to get at the aspirations of people. Here's an uh, advert from Packard, a famous car maker. And says to the to the to write where we are here we are envying right, not having the car and that at the bottom here we are being envied. So the idea obviously was this whole imaginary of the new regional development with suburbs tapped into the aspirations. So this is then the theory of city building. You need an idea of the good city. We need a normative ideal. What is the normative aspiration that we judge all the projects by. Secondly, we need a broad coalition of actors. Because this is not the 20th century, this is not the age of hierarchical modernist government where you could say society what to do. This is the age of horizontal governance net networks reaching out also to market and civil society. And thirdly, capturing social aspirations. These are the three component parts, I think, of a working new imaginary. Now, I think that when you invoke post-fossil, people mostly think about it negatively. It's the limit to growth syndrome. It's limits to growth is taking away possibility from people. Whereas, in fact, we need to give people freedom to think about their futures, aspirations, after all. So can we think about a post-fossil city delight? Can we think positively about that city? I think we need to. Because if we don't, it doesn't work. Me and my colleagues, we are in the business of facts. But facts don't persuade. People are enticed by perspective. We need to have perspectives that guide future living and that guide the aspirations of people. And in that sense, there's a new literature, literature that I strongly recommend by people like Jens Becker. And what did they do? They studied market organizations, banks, real estate developers. And what did they come out with was the idea that because we have that uncertainty, we can't allocate money. We need a fictional expectation that something is going to happen. And I think that is a reservoir that we can tap into. Develop the imagined cities that create a sort of a certainty or an, an idealism about the future. And that's precisely the opposite, obviously, of what we see happening. At the moment, people search for the certainty in the past. Eh? Make a country great again. Eh? But here is the trick of trying to capture the power of the future. And then I think it helps if you have these sort of theorists on your side. The point is, it is half about facts and it's half about fiction. And that is leading us back, I think, to the quality of design that allows you to think about a city that's not yet there, but might be there. And that's aspirational. So it's a politics of the imagination. And that, I think, is a struggle. Because we are not alone in this game. Obviously, there are many people trying to organize the imagination for us. And if I have one worry as an academic, I think that is about the unevenness in that politics of the future. Because the smart city, I suppose, is one of those candidate imaginaries of the future. 
But if we don't articulate a public idea of what the good city is, how can we judge which smart technology we want? How can we judge the, re the configuration within which we use that technology? What is the smart city for? So we need to counterbalance, I suppose, the power of communication that Packet Bell, in the, or Packet, I should say, in the earlier advert, already showed, and that is still with us at this moment. So these renderings, for me, are as much about the city of Corbusier as they are about our future city. And this nothing is a coincidence. So the, to show a driverless car, this is a blind man. You've probably seen the Waymo uh, a video clip. It's a blind man, but where do we see him driving? In a suburb. Whereas I suppose many people would say, in the future, we may actually have different sort of organizations, social spatial organizations. So they fixate the urban imaginary and add a product. So the question that we should discuss is how does smart contribute to a good city? Have we examples of how that it works to the benefit of our good city? And what is a good city anyway? It's a it's very political issue and I think it needs to be discussed by experts, but by citizens and politicians as well. How do futures organize themselves? Ideally, people experience them. Well, here is an example. I suppose where you can see what a post-fossil city looks like, because we have some elements of a post-fossil city already. This is the new railway station in Rotterdam in the Netherlands. And look at the way in which they reorganized a downtown urban area. So the cars are underneath, the bicycles have all the public domain, people come out of public transport as if, uh, you know, uh, as if they're entering the city in the, in, the, in the most prestigious way. It's definitely different from Penn State. Eh? And, and it is obviously also like a cathedral, so it expresses public value. It expresses the idea that public transport is not only for those who can't afford a car. No, it is, as we know, in the best cities of the world, people like to use public transport rather than having to use it. This is Copenhagen, investing expensive infrastructure for bikes. Or here in uh, downtown Amsterdam, where the cars just have been taken out of the street. This is now only for street cars and for bicycles. Or Addis Ababa, where obviously we have the nightmare of African urbanization, where we know that if we go on the trajectory of Le Corbusier in Africa, we're done. There is no, no more need to work towards the two degree car target because the power of the force of, uh, of urbanization there is so, so huge. So here, the Chinese built urban idea of a tram uh, streetcar is actually helping alleviate slightly the commuter needs. Or here in Belgium, where they have a project called Living Streets, where they just experience what a street can be if it's no longer a parking place. How to get there? Now, I think, as I already said, we can't do it in the old way. We need to rethink how we do it. And here is something stands in the way, that idea that there is no alternative. I suppose it is up to us as a broad community, and, and ULI is, I think, fantastic in convening such an, or, uh, such an event like this, to think about these living alternatives. And we need to do that outside the silos. We need to connect to designers, but also to people from banks to, that have to make their risk-return calculations in a different sort of way, beyond product and beyond projects. I think one of the problems in Toronto is that it's going so well that there is almost no space for urban planning. There are so many projects that need to be allocated that it is difficult to start to think about sort of the good city on the, ci on the city or a regional level. But that new normal needs to be stayed soon, that we no longer think that the post-fossil city is something we need, but something that we aspire. And I suppose these coalitions we can build differently than in the past. In the past, people voted, and that was their political moment. But voting has become unpredictable. In, Fran in France, two people actually made it to the last presidential route, but completely out of the traditional party system. Macron is, is actually not a party, but a man. Yeah? So we need to think about a new way of creating 
political legitimacy in cities. And I think gatherings like these become then very important. Working through government levels, not in a hierarchical mode, but in a horizontal collaborative mode. You can sense I'm from Northern Europe. That's a bit in the uh, polder model that we uh, grow up with. But I think I said something that, that, that speaks to, to, to Toronto in particular. You have a vulnerability in the sense that you, if you don't act, I think, coming from the outside, obviously, you know more about it than I do, electorally, you have different value orientations depending on where you live in the region. So my argument would be try and use a typological approach. Think about the new case site as the city of your future. Think about a regional spot somewhere in the suburb and develop it, make it an, into an experience where people can feel what the alternative is and that everybody can see his or her role in that future. That is the trick that they performed in 1939 and we have to find a way of doing it. I'll conclude. As part of the biennial, I had a difficult task of thinking about the next economy that was post-fossil, socially just, and economically viable. And I said, it, it's very simple. That future is going to be green or it's not going to be. But how do I get people from the European political scene to take on that dream of an alternative? I used design. So what I did, I organized a 13-minute multimedia clip that was as big as from here to the wall. And people could stand around it. It was if the world of where the Netherlands, the UK, Denmark, all the countries around the North Sea reached the two-degree target. And it slowly unfolded itself from 19, of 2016 to 2050. And we reached that target by building a stunning 25,000 10 megawatt windmills on the North Sea, apart from insulating the homes, etc. But that point that these ministers of the European Union could stand around that future, spoke to their imagination. They came to an agreement to actually pursue this goal, the countries bordering the North Sea, and I was invited even to come and speak to the Polish uh, state-owned uh, coal and gas uh, company that wanted to show this imaginary to its people. So the idea that you can use design to organize your, out of, your way out of political deadlock, I think, it offers an opportunity for us to recapture the future. Or to say it differently, we shape the world through the stories we tell. So let us find a way to tell these stories again, to think about these places that we really like. City planning, then, is world building. I think... Ladies and gentlemen, we can make this century into the best century. But we moved, have to then well move beyond the project-based planning and product placements that I see emerging and capturing our minds. We need no new normative imaginaries, dare to be normative about the cities we really want, and use the complexity, so not only target on social equality, or on the climate, or on the economy. Use that complexity to break through the siloed bureaucracies that dominated us in the 20th century. Imagine through design, I think, is then a way to also organize these loosely coupled coalitions that may then be the force of change. And in my imagination, you're most certainly a key part of that coalition. Thank you for your attention. Well, thank you so much, Martin. Uh, you ended abruptly. I was still busily typing notes, madly scribbling down questions to ask you. There was a tremendous amount of food for thought in your conversation today. And what I'd like to do is tease out maybe a few themes that I heard that I think are particular challenges uh, or questions for us on the regional scale. And the first is this. It really is a question, uh, what I will call the problem of scale. And one of the things we struggle with just in the city of Toronto 
is the magnitude of the challenge that we often face. And how do you actually begin to bring down the problem to a scale that we feel like it's something that we can actually tackle and we can actually manage. Now, you're speaking in the room here to leaders from across the region. Just the city of Toronto alone is 617 square kilometers. Amsterdam's region, by comparison, is 212. We are being extolled in this presentation by you to think in an even greater regional scale, so thinking about the regional narrative. How do you get your hands around that? How do you actually begin to build that regional narrative when the region, particularly in our case, is so sprawling, it's so unwieldy, where do we even begin? There is no uh, single answer to that. Eh? I think it always has to be a multiscalar thing. Uh, my worry is with, uh, if we take an analytical approach, then I would talk about a global urbanization like Neil Brenner does or, and, 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 and tell you about the overshoot that we have in terms of resources or talk about parts per million, but you know, nobody relates to that sort of language. So the global scale is where the problems are, uh, some of the problems at least, but that's not at all where you can relate to people and to action of, of business. On the other hand, it's the, uh, the, the level of the household, and that's where people still have their ideals. Right? So in the Netherlands, for instance, if you want to be successful, you want to have these, one of these really sturdy fireplaces, these furnaces, you know, really sturdy, but they're gas-fired. So the people investing, you know, what is it, $10,000 in a, in a furnace that the government says in five years, you know, it has to go. <laughs> so in between that are all sort of skills that we need. And I think that a particularly important level is that of a quarter, an urban quarter, because that's where people can relate to and where you still can make a difference as a, as a municipality. So um, earlier this afternoon, we spoke about uh, the, the new waterfront development. That level, that skill level, I think is really cool. And that is actually something you see in many of these uh, cities that over the 20th century uh, grew so much and, uh, and, and, and caused that great acceleration. And it's also a level where people can relate to. So the, the, that quarter level, urban quarter level, is, I think, really important. However, if you think about urban sociology, we would always say, or urban economics, the daily urban system. That, I mean, that language we all know, that is just where does the, how is the commuter uh, orga organized in your region? I mean, that was the early 1960s eh, that we started to talk about it. So that regional level, I suppose, defined by the urban, daily urban system, makes perfect planning sense. But again, that's the planning talk, and that's not a level at which people normally think. Well, I'm glad you raised that, because we have sort of a strange dynamic in this region, which is that the daily level can actually be regional. The people are moving vast distances, yeah commuting, whether on transit or in a vehicle, a very, very long distance in order to get to work every day. And I was about to challenge you and suggest that rather than thinking about building up the regional narrative, we need to ensure that we have a strong policy framework, strong objectives at the regional level in terms of what it is that we're seeking to achieve. But really, that's actually going to become real at the neighborhood level, that that actually mm -hmm. becomes something that is transformative when it begins to provide places where people can live their daily lives with different kinds of choices, where, you know, in, in my world, because I'm way down in the weeds, where we are building out main streets, mm -hmm. where there are destinations within walking distance of home so that people have the choice of being able to do things on foot or cycling or a short transit ride from where they live, as opposed to having to think about living on a regional scale. And I think that there's, there's something about what you've called the daily systems or the urban systems of everyday life. There's something about actually getting the really, really detailed granular planning of our communities right that is actually going to drive and build out that transformative place on a regional, on a regional scale. How do you link those two together? Yeah. No, I think that... that uh um, ideally, you would 
create a system that allows people to have more quality of life. And, and one of the, the things that, that's characteristic for, for this region is, of course, that many people spend far too much time in, in a car or in public transport to try and get to work or get back home. So there are obviously many ways in which you can act upon that, but it starts with people liking where they live and actually having work close by. So the, the urbanization of the suburb is, I think, an issue that uh, we will uh, have to uh, address. I think that over the last uh, you know, uh, two decades, and also with, the, with, with uh, books like The Triumph of the City, there's become an incredible emphasis on the core, and the, the, the suggestion that there is a natural flow to the core of cities. But if you make the, the sum right, you know, always people pay a price for the success of the core. And that's these people sitting in these long commuter times. So if there is an alternative that says, well, we're going to try and organize an interesting urban area in the urban region, has some multinodal uh, development of the region, then you help them, and you actually also create the sort of lifestyles that people like when they come to the downtown. I mean, they leave... I mean, what is it more? Is it a push or a pull? Huh? That's, that's it. Do they leave the suburb because they can afford it and they like to live closer to where it's exciting? Or, you know, so you never know quite what is the dominant. But I think that is something that for this region is really particularly important. And, we, of course, know that there is some, such a thing as transit-oriented development, where uh, you really want to make your transit investment work by densifying around these nodes that you then create. Tremendous success. I mean, one, one example is Bangkok, where uh, they had an incredible uh, congestion problem, and uh, they corrected that with a, a light rail. And, I mean, the real estate effects of that light rail is, is stunning. And... Now, colleagues actually in, in Bangkok see that whereas in uh, 10 or 15 years ago, students, when they had to describe their aspirations, they described a suburban home with a lawn and a car. And now they start to describe that they like to live close to a transport node in a high rise. So there is a way in which these two things inter interrelate. If the lifestyle with the car and the lawn in the, in the suburb comes with a long commuter time, then these values may shift. Well, you don't have to go to Bangkok. You're kind of telling the Toronto story. Uh, that's actually what's happening right here. It's happening in our region. One of the reasons that we are seeing so much growth in the core of Toronto right now is precisely because of that trade-off. In the downtown uh, of Toronto, 75% of the population lives within five kilometers of where they work and walks or cycles or takes transit to work. So mm -hmm. that's really what, it, it's that choice that's actually driving the transformation that we see in the core of downtown Toronto. The real question for us is, and you, you hit on it, around this question of where people work, the tension that we have right now is that the downtown, in many ways, uh, is in fact so successful in delivering on this quality mm -hmm. of life on a regional scale that it's very difficult to, in fact, see growth out in our centers and to see that kind of multifaceted community in our, in our centers on a regional scale that results in that kind of very urban type of living in other places yeah. in the region. And it's a struggle in other places, both within the city of Toronto, whether we're talking about the Scarborough Town Centre or North York or our you know, what we're building out is our Etobicoke center, but also in other centers on the region, in part because of really the vortex that the downtown is, in part because it's so many years ahead. It has, mm -hmm. we have the sporting venues, the cultural events, the universities, the research, the offices attracted. We have the public space and the public life in the core that in turn attracts the employment, employment uses. The question for us is really how we, in fact, truly become a multi-centered region. And, you know, as a chief planner of Toronto, it's really super for me that we've got all this growth in the downtown core. But, you know, as a citizen of the province, uh, yeah. I know that a critical part of our sustainability is actually being able to create places where people can live and work yeah. within a relatively short distance of their homes. And those homes are spread all the way across the region. Yeah. Yeah, so I mean, it's always difficult, I suppose, to square the uh, 
sort of really spread out suburban development with the post-fossil city. That's going to be really difficult. Uh, so you need to rethink the typology there. And, and, but perhaps we must ask designers, architects, urban planners, urban designers to come up with proposals because we still think in terms of a very classical Corbusier agenda. And so the, the suburb is invented by uh, Ebenezer Howard and, and say the downtown is invented by Corbusier. But where, where are these, all these other ways in which we can live? Um, there, there must be uh, markets for them. We can't tap into them with survey, sur because then people are asked within the confines of their imagination. We need an ontological expansion. People should have much broader mindset. And there, I think, is uh, if you really want to do sort of 21st century planning, you need to uh, have that sort of cultural approach to it as well. So perhaps organize a Toronto biennial or so <laughs> I, to, to, to allow that to happen or to, to, to say, you know, we, these are experimental zones where we have one committed to do it differently. Well, I like the fact that you've raised this, this question of imagination because I truly believe that there will be a moment in time, not far from now, when, you know, maybe our children, maybe my children, uh, will look back and say, um, I can't believe you commuted for 45 minutes That's every, awesome. like what on earth were you thinking? Who yeah. wants to live that way? Yeah. And I do think that there's, we've just sort of accepted at this moment in history, we've accepted a certain way of living that is really actually filled with profound compromises. Okay, you don't ever yeah. get to put your kids to bed because you're always in your car. To me, that's a phenomenal compromise to have accepted. And I do think part of what we are seeing pushing back in this generation that is very much choosing to live in smaller spaces, to live in the downtown and say, you know what? Sure, it would be great to have a yard and see robins nesting out back, right. but it's not quite it's not quite worth the trade-off of having mm -hmm. to sit in a car for an hour and a half every every day. And the notion yeah. that that's a choice, I think, is something that for many people of an older generation, it's hard to believe that that's a choice that's being made yeah. because it takes a lot of imagination because it's so different from what we believe to be the appropriate typology for how how we should live. How do you you know how does a society make that shift? Well, I was struck by uh, actually at a ULI a meeting in uh, in Amsterdam was that uh, project developers said the Dutch people don't want to live in apartments. I said, well, how do you know? Well, you know, that's what we find. <laughs> but actually, at the moment, everybody seems to be wanting to live in apartments, if it's, a, it's the right sort of apartment. They missed an incredible market opportunity. So there is something wrong in the way in which we, as professionals, approach the people. We, we reproduce an image of, that we have of them by the way we ask questions. Now, I'm, in that sense, a bit privileged because after my government term, I went back to the university. And the one wonderful thing, many wonderful things about the university is that you constantly deal with young people. Now, if you ask them how they think they, they, want, they are going to live, not necessarily how they want to live, but how they're going to live, they don't say that they're going to live in a suburban house because they say, I'm not going to have a, a, a job that's permanent, so I can't get a mortgage. And by the way, I may actually go for two years to Hong Kong, etc. So they have a very different imagined future. So tapping into other reservoirs of the imagination might actually help us spot the markets that we, that we do not presently see. Well, and the flip side is we can, of course, also be moving towards a much more sustainable typology as, as a result uh, if we get away from those, those assumptions. There's a great study... Um, that came out of MIT last year, where some re researchers went out and asked university students, they could have one, they couldn't have both. They could have a smartphone or a car. Can't have both. You only get one in your life. You only get a car or a smartphone. Well, you can imagine, overwhelmingly, these students said, I'm not living without my phone. I don't have to have a car, but my phone, forget it. If you're gonna give me a phone or a car and I only get one, I'm definitely going to choose my phone. And I think that's a really important indicator with respect to how uh, young people of the future want to live. 
Now, the, these, you know, were students at MIT. That's an important consideration, but it is an indicator of being able to imagine a very different kind of future. I know that for my parents, the idea of living out without a car was inconceivable because how mm -hmm. would they how would they live without a car? So I think that this notion of being able to imagine a different kind of future needs to be a really critical driver in creating a, a really sustainable new kind of typology in terms of our built forms. Yeah. No, I think that's, that's true. And the example you, you give is, of course, of, uh, of this whole domain of mobility. That is a killer when it comes to CO2 emissions, and it is a killer when it comes to premature deaths. It's, it, we thought that air pollution had been resolved, and it's back on the agenda in a big way. Um, but I also think it's relatively easy, actually, mobility, because you see that triple revolution. Eh? So you get, uh, we're going from fossil base to electric cars, uh, we're going from uh, ownership to, to a service, and we're going from driving it ourselves to uh, self-driving vehicles. And if you see that, that's all, you know, exactly for the millennials. That's precisely, they don't attach their identity to a car. So that worry that in the classical idea you had about cars, that you can't get it away from them, well, that's actually not true for the, for the younger generation. So, and it, since people tend to now buy a car every seven years or so, it's relatively easy to think about how you get to a post-fossil mobility system um, within that domain of mobility. However, here comes the thing. What do we do? We also realize that this whole distinction that we have between public transport and private transport is going to blur. Mm -hmm. it, it, it's probably going to end in the middle. And I'm not sure if... Are, are you also in charge of transport here? Transportation planning, but not transportation services. Not the okay. street lights or the roads. Yeah, no, but the thing is, of course, transport in the, in the old public transport sense requires you to know a lot about the future. And you can only recoup your money if you cancel out all sorts of alternatives. And this is the world in which the, all these alternatives are just emerging. They don't even ask for permission. They just emerge. So this, this tendency of private and public transport to, to blur and to become something in the middle is, is very much with us. And I think, therefore, it helps if a city government says what a good city is. How do you want that public transport to work? For whom? With security and safety issues and, and, and zero emission, etc. So that it can, uh, the innovation is steered in the direction you want. Because otherwise, you're always surprised. And if you, if you don't give them permission, People say, well, you're your old-fashioned government. So in order for governments in the 21st century to be in charge, you need to dare to touch the normative, I think. Is that, but well, you're I, not I'm, afraid I'm for smiling. the normative, right? I'm, I'm smiling because you said, oh, the transportation piece is easy, and I'm thinking, you've never tried to plan a bike lane in Toronto, because <laughs> that is not easy, nor is trying to plan a new transit line in Toronto, and all of those are really precursors to... Yeah providing the choice, because really what you're talking about is a mobility system where there's a whole variety of choices that people can employ to get where they need to go, and that really does assume uh, an urban typology that is not planned around a car, because if it's planned around a car, yeah. the best way to get from point A to B is going to be a car. But when we, as we adapt and transform our suburbs and we add out main streets with more density, then we start to bring forward the option of more choices. Right. Then it becomes possible for people to conceive of, oh, I could actually walk to do my groceries yeah. because there's a main street in my neighborhood where there's a store that sells groceries. Or, oh, I could do that. That's only a few kilometers. I can do that on my bike because there's safe cycling infrastructure and I don't have to worry about my safety and I don't have to worry about my two kids who I'm bringing along with me because they'll be safe too. So I think the challenge is there, in order for that vision to materialize, there are really practical things that we need to do around adding more density, because it's not going to work without density, around adding cycling infrastructure. In places like downtown Toronto, our sidewalks are too narrow, securing wider sidewalks, so there's just more room in the public realm for people. And I would say that if you look at our region, we, you know, we have a very, very long way to to go. You know, mm -hmm. when you talk, you began by talking about undoing the mistakes of the 21st century. We're still making some of those mistakes. Yeah. We yeah. really are. We've still, we, we haven't actually fully committed ourselves to planning in a fundamentally different way. Yeah. 
No, that, that's right. I mean, we need to be bold. Or, uh, it was announced that I was going to be bold, but I think there is, a, is an alternative for, say, the classical way, say, you know, I, I have a vision and I'm not going to impose it like Robert Moses could do until the 1960s. <laughs> But there is an alternative. Which, which is you, you We're followers of Jane Jacobs in this room. Yeah, I, so I bet. Know. I bet. But, but <laughs> it's for, for teaching actually very helpful to put these two against each other. But uh, Robert Moses, had, in his early years, was actually a pretty damn good planner. But um, anyway, <laughs> uh, but there is an alternative that's to smuggle change into the system. And uh, in a, a great example is, of course, New York with uh, Janet Sadek Khan, who, who basically first had people experience what bigger sidewalks do and a, a pedestrianization of Broadway in Times Square. And once they started to love it, they made it permanent. Even the retail business that thought it was a nightmare for them found that it was economically very viable. So my suggestion to you is try it out. And try it out at, at, at several streets and but monitor really detailedly what it does to accidents, what it does to uh, the uh, turnover within the shops and to real estate prices. Because my uh, uh, suggestion is that the retail, uh, the prices of real estate go up, the retail turnover goes up as well, accidents go down, and the appreciation of the neighborhood in terms of placemaking goes way up. So, but people still have a difficulty to imagine the alternative. Here in Toronto, you still have two lane roads in the downtown. I don't understand it. I mean, the, 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 the pavements are too narrow. I mean, they should be twice as big. People slow down on a, on a broad pavement. They buy more. I mean, people in a car never buy anything. People on a pavement that are slow walkers, they are, you know, enticed to go into a shop and, yeah, I shop, therefore I am. I love this idea of smuggling that's like totally fits with my ethos, my approach to planning. Uh, we have a smuggling project underway. Uh, Barbara Gray, the new GM of transportation planning for the city of Toronto is in this room somewhere. Barbara, give a white rave right in the center. Uh, I'm working very closely with Barbara on a report that we're bringing forward for a project uh, this year, which is the King Street pilot. Now King Street, one of our main streets that runs right through the heart of the city, through the financial district. We move 65,000 people a day on transit, and the uh, corridor right now functions as a mixed-use corridor. And the pilot is meant to be a form of smuggling. It's all about creating a transit priority corridor, getting the cars mm -hmm. out of the way and increasing the transit capacity of that corridor. One of the things we struggle with when we try to smuggle in this city is that we are, uh, we are asked for a tremendous amount of research and a tremendous yeah. amount of data. And one of the challenges is if you look to our counterparts in New York City, mm -hmm. they just went and did it. They put the project out there. They tried it. They evaluated it. They collected data as it was happening. And I see Barbara nodding her head there because uh, she's done it in Seattle as well. She did a whole series of pilot projects in Seattle. And our challenge in this context is that we want to analyze it and write yeah. reports and analyze it again. And we never actually get to that point of being able to do what you were talking about in your presentation was this notion that people aren't persuaded by facts, but that they're guided by perspective. I think that's on one hand depressing and on the other hand really inspiring because I think that perspective is actually gained through some of these smuggling projects mm -hmm. where you, in fact, introduce ideas and people experience them and you generate outcomes and then you go, oh, the city can work like that. Mm -hmm. I had no idea. Yeah. But part of what we get, we, we get wrapped up in in this context is a lot of analytics. And, yeah. you know, any insights that you have for that kind of a struggle? Yeah. Well, of course, my, my, my work has always been about research, and I've been com uh, commissioned to do all these analysis from the planning <laughs> agency. So you're not going to help me. <laughs> no, no, but I can t give you an insight. Uh, these sums are made on certain uh, assumptions, and uh, they don't speak to the reality. So they, they cannot, they are not value neutral at all. They're based on the old premises. So... Uh, the, so analytically, the best approach is to try it and then to analyze it. That is what we teach these days in uh, public, public policy. Yeah, that uh, a, a learning adaptive system is much better in optimizing than one that 
puts all the analysis up front. That's really old-fashioned. That's called benefit analysis, sort of 1950s style. And, the, and then, you know, the old system was analyze and then instruct the world. What we now do is to, to uh, s spread examples and then select the best. That, that system works much better. And I suppose the... I mean, smuggling is negative. It wasn't meant to be negative. It's a, it's a well, tactical well, urbanism. I took it as a positive. Yeah, no, 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 no. But I think politically that's vulnerable, smuggling. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, but the point was also that in New York they said it was temporarily. Huh? So they, 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 they left it open whether they were going to do it more, depending on how people responded. But when people responded so positively, they then spread out uh, the, uh, the solution. And I suppose that's that's what you often get. I mean, in, in my managerial roles, I often couldn't get my new innovative plans through my board. So I, I basically organized them through a bypass, and then everybody wanted them. And so the, there is something in our organizational structures that seems to be inherently conservative. And that's why I was interested to do something like a biennial, because that's cultural. So, you know, what's the risk of a cultural event? But it allows also everybody to just to mm -hmm. feel it out. You know, is this is this something for me? And with less risk also for people that initiate it. So perhaps sometimes political decisions should be the culmination point rather than the start. So is that what you're talking about when you say that decisions should be guided by perspective instead of facts, by these best practices? Yeah, and perhaps I said perspective, but I, I, I mean it, but a, a lot of what we now discuss is experience, eh? that mm -hmm. people actually experience the possibility of an alternative. And one way we do that in our everyday life is to go abroad, right? We, we go to Bogota or Curitiba to see how a BRT can function, and then come back and say, I've seen that it worked. And what I did was to make them stand around it. But so the, to experience an alternative, that seems to be important for chiefs, but then, you know, these chiefs can go on a plane for professional trips, but citizens cannot. So, and I will always try and avoid making the mistakes that the Robert Moseses of this world made, imposing it on it. You will like it, right? That's, you cannot get away with that anymore. So, but to have these modest tactical experiments like in King, they may be the way to organize that shared experience in Toronto as well. I'm supportive of that. Martin, thank you so much for your insights. Uh, on behalf of everyone in the room, thank you for coming here and speaking to us this evening. It's been absolutely inspiring and I hope has broadened everyone's perspective. Please join me in thanking Martin for his presentation tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Well, ladies and gentlemen, first off, I, uh, I'd, I'd like to thank uh, Jennifer uh, Kiesmad and Professor Heyer for a very inspiring uh, and interesting dialogue. So thank you very much. You know, some people asked me earlier today, why is, why is Uber giving the closing remarks at, at a conference like this? Uh, and then I heard Professor Heyer talk about uh, a time of transition, uh, and this concept of uh, smuggling change into a city. Uh, then I heard uh, Jennifer say that uh, you know young people, and I'm representing them by the way, uh, will choose a phone over a car. And I'm going to disagree with Jennifer and say actually. They can get both. Uh, so that's why Uber's here. Uh, one of the things that I learned from, uh, from watching Jennifer's work and from reading uh, about some of her work is that you know, technology companies are great and technology is uh, important as we think about some of the more pressing challenges that we face in our cities. But technology and technology companies are a necessary but insufficient condition uh, of unlocking a more rich uh, public space or, or communities. Uh, and I think we realize that at Uber. And we've talked a lot about imagination here tonight. 
Uh, and, uh, and really, you know, we've got, we're here because we, we want to be part of this room and this group of people who are imagining uh, a better future for our community. So that's why we're here. But we also realize, you know, imagination and shared vision is not enough. There also has to be partnerships uh, and coalitions, uh, in the words of Professor Heyer. Uh, and we couldn't agree more. There has to be those partnerships. There has to be those, uh, those coalitions. And when you get it both, when you have shared vision and when you have partnership, the last uh, secret ingredient is often just giving it a try. Uh, and giving it a try or testing something out uh, on that theme, I'd be remiss if I did not mention our friends in Innisfil uh, who are here tonight with us, who are giving it a try, doing something very bold. And in just a couple of weeks, we'll be entering into a pilot uh, where we're going to do something very in innovative outside of Toronto uh, in a town who came to us a few months ago with a problem, a uh, lack of uh, you know, viable and affordable uh, public transportation for its citizens. And we're going to help out. Uh, and we hope to be a part of a really fascinating experiment. So we've got that vision, that shared vision. We've got a great coalition or partnership, and we're going to give it a shot. Uh, with that all said, uh, my last job tonight is to say a thank you, uh, not just to Professor Heyer and to Jennifer Kiesmet, but also to ULI. Uh, thank you for having us. Thank you for hosting us. Thank you. Uh, we're very proud to be a sponsor of this event. Thank you for convening us all here tonight. Uh, it really is. Uh, Examples of engagements like this, uh, examples of civic uh, leadership that do make uh, the, the greater Toronto region uh, one of the more prosperous uh, and livable cities in the world. So thank you very much. Okay, we are we are done. Um, I just do do want to uh, though uh, jump on the thank you uh, theme here. Just to also thank you, uh, Sheldon, and thank you, Uber, thank you, WSP, thank you, Pearson um, Airport. This this is uh, would not be happening without your support. Thank you. Every single table here is a sponsor. Amazing. Um, so thank you all for supporting this event. But the most important thank you. Um, really is, is to all of the chief planners, the senior planning community, uh, and the public sector, municipal, provincial, uh, agency, and so forth, and elected, actually, I should mention Peter Milton here uh, as standing in, Elisa stepped out. Um, so um, thank you all for a very, very great, great evening. And with that, we're done. We'll see some of you tomorrow morning with Richard Florida and Premier Wynne. But for others, we'll see you in the near future. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. <laughs>